to um, today's and now for something completely machinima podcast. Um, today I'm joined by John McInnes, who is actually a screenwriter by profession, uh, notably for the video game Call of Duty Advanced Warfare, which I think was published in 2014, I think. Uh, right, but John, yeah. John's going to tell us that all about that in a minute. Um, he also has a few other claims to fame. Firstly, he's been um, awarded a fellowship in screenwriting from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences for his action thriller script, Outside the Wire. Uh, he is the person behind one of the internet's biggest gaming memes, Press F to pay <laughs> respects, which I think is hilarious. Um, and also was the co-creator in 2017 of a fascinating interactive art installation for the Art of VR New York at Sotheby's exhibition called We the People, which puts you actually in the face of a couple of US presidents. Um, since his days on Call of Duty, John has launched his own virtual production studio called McInnes Studios, um, which primarily uses Unreal Engine and has produced a television pilot for The Simpsons. Uh, and currently he's working on a really interesting project about um, a virtual David Bowie, which maybe he'll tell us a little bit more about. John is also the creator of the very popular Facebook group called Real Time Filmmakers, which currently has around nine and a half thousand members. I think it only had about nine thousand members the last time we spoke. So it's, it's growing exponentially um, since it was launched just in 2020. Um, the group focuses on render engines such as Unreal and Unity. Um, and as part of that community, John also uh, created a machinima contest called the uh, the real I was going to say the unreal the real time shorts challenge in 2021 where creators had 30 days to submit their own work using character assets he'd provided one being called virtual grace um, an avatar with a few dance moves and another being some soldiers actually I think that contest was um, one of the very few uh, machinima and real-time contest we, we'd seen on the show at the time. Um, so, John, it's a real pleasure to, to welcome to, um, you to the show. Um, thanks for, for coming on again. Um, do you, first of all, want to tell us a bit about your background and how you came to be a screenwriter for Call of Duty? Sure. Um, um, yes, uh, where to go back? I mean, I did... Uh, I did um, studied film at uh, Goldsmiths College, uh, University of London, back in the early 90s. Um, I was always into film and, and, and stuff, and so film was, film was my focus. And then um, writing became the sort of um, the way forward because it was the, uh, the least expensive thing to do. You know, you just needed to come up with an idea and put it on paper, whereas making a movie and being a director involved a, a lot more expense. Um, uh, that eventually... Um, I, I ended up doing a, a master's degree in screenwriting in, in London at the University of um, uh, London, uh, Royal Holloway. Um, and that brought me to Los Angeles. Uh, one person in the, in the year could do an exchange to UCLA to complete the master's degree at UCLA on the, on the MFA screenwriting program. So that brought me here in 20, uh, 2003, 2004. And uh, I ended up actually moving to Los Angeles. Um, as a result of that, because I thought, well, if you're going to be making movies, maybe Los Angeles is the, is the place to be. Um, so then I was I was here, you know, doing stuff, trying to get projects off the ground, writing, um, and then eventually I won um, something called the Nickel, which is the Nickel Fellowship in Screenwriting that's organised through the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, otherwise known as the, the Oscars, and happens to be the biggest screenwriting competition in the world. So I. I wrote a script that won, won that um, back in 2011, 2012. Um, and so that then sort of launched my screenwriting career in Hollywood. You know, um, um, I got repped by ICM and Brillstein, two manager and agents that are quite reputable. Um, and then that also got me hired to write a, a little video game called Call of Duty. Um, and I, I wasn't, I would say that my, my path is very much towards movies and screenwriting and, and you know, live action movies. And so when, when a, a video game was offered to me, I was, I was like, sure, sounds good. Um, I, I wasn't much of a gamer um, at the time. Um, uh, but in hindsight, I'm extremely you know, grateful to have taken this path or had the opportunity to, to work on that. 
as there was a real opening of a door um, for me, um, the experience of that. Um, it also happened to be that Call of Duty Advanced Force was the first Call of Duty that was going to be on the new um, PlayStation 4 platforms and Xbox One. So there was a sort of increase in resolution. And so they were very interested in, in making these, um, you know, making the game very high fidelity, very photorealistic. Um, and therefore they wanted to hire screenwriting talent as opposed to, you know, game talent to sort of bring Hollywood cinematic storytelling to, to the game. And they hired Kevin Spacey to be, uh, to be the main bad guy. Um, and so uh, I was hired to basically bring, bring a bit of cinematic magic to Call of Duty. Um, and, you know, from my experience working on Call of Duty, it was, it was a real uh, revelation you know, it's it's in the way. You know, here I am you know, writing stories essentially, and that you know, my my aspect of what what was up, my involvement with the game was was stories and characters. Um, but we're using game engines, obviously, in a game, and it's three dimensional and it's interactive. Um, and just the level of fidelity blew me away when I first saw the first test come through mm-hmm. for you know one of the characters that I had written a scene for, and just looking at it as a you know, 2D scene on the screen and thinking, well, this is a, a, a 3D avatar that looks, you know, like the actor that I, you know, had written for. And the scene looked amazing. And always in my mind, I was like, but this is three dimensional and it's interactive. And I was just thinking, well, this is obviously the future. It's the next iteration of storytelling, you know, moving forwards, um, or at least, you know, the use of these tools were. So as a sort of naive outsider, I was like, well, this is obviously the future, like, like game engines, right? You know, this is, this is what it is, um, you know, to make 2D content or 3D content. It seemed like the most uh, exciting way to tell stories now. So um, I obviously learned a lot on Call of Duty. Um, it was a very steep learning curve and, and very exciting and interesting. Um, you know, I learned everything about game engines, photo real environments, immersive worlds and interactivity. Um, motion capture, performance capture, digital avatars, you know, that, that works. And, and at the time, I didn't realize the level of education I was getting. because I was like, oh, let's go work on this video game. And it just so happened to be the biggest game on the planet. And, you know, employing the most cutting edge techniques and technologies to, to achieve what it was. Um, so I came off of that. I mean, that was published in 2014. Um, I was super excited. I went and wrote another uh, video game, actually, that was a uh, action adventure in the sort of telltale games kind of um, mold of storytelling, which again sort of expanded my um, understanding um, and experience of storytelling. Um, as I said, I felt like I, I got a very good grounding as a, as a screenwriter and then to work on Call of Duty and then to work on this other project really uh, you know, opened my horizons as a storyteller um, using these technologies. And then of course, um, VR was kicking off in a big way with the Oculus acquisition uh, by um, Mark Zuckerberg, um, and so VR was was hot. And I thought, well, this is I'm I'm at the right point at the right time to be really sort of pushing forwards into this realm. Um, I understood the technologies, understood what was possible, and I was really excited to explore what what was what we could do. Really, I thought this is this is super super exciting. So I spent a good few years um, using primarily using digital humans because you know as a screenwriter, as a storyteller. Um, human characters are sort of my my jam, I guess. Um, and you got very good at using you know digital avatars in the Unreal Engine. You know, a lot of people in, at that time, especially in VR, I mean, they were, it's just not possible. You're just not going to be able to do that. But I, I guess having worked on come off Call of Duty and seen what we were doing on that, I thought well, it doesn't seem like that much of a, a difference. You know, in terms of you know if you understand what what's going on. So we did quite a few projects around digital humans. Um, I ended up self-funding a couple of demos. Uh, one was the Grace project that you that you spoke of in the introduction. The other one was the, the Soldiers, which was actually the Navy SEALs. That's a sort of a project that uh, I wanted to do um, about the uh, Bin Laden raid with the Navy SEALs uh, in, in 2011. I wanted to recreate that. Um, you know, obviously having done Call of Duty, I had a lot of high level exposure to um, military folks, um, you know, my, my technical advisors was Mitch Hall, who was the 20 year Navy SEAL Team 6 veteran who advised Mark and Catherine on the, on the, on the movie Zero Dark Thirty, things like that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and Tom Greer, who uh, has now passed away, but he was the, the Delta Force commander who went into Tora Bora after Bin Laden 
in 2002 and he commanded that mission he, and these people were my technical advisors so so i thought you know i didn't really want to do a sort of first person shooter experience but i thought i really wanted to maybe explore what war was really like by exploring a documentary in vr but a very you know fairly realistic one and and i and i mention all of this because it, it, this has bearing on on machinima and then filmmaking because um though i i made those demos back in what, 2016, 2015, 2016, um, they were kind of evolving because they were self-funded. So we were, you know, putting a lot of favors and, a, you know, a lot of people came on board to help out with that. Um, but those demos, uh, those demos themselves, you know, they were shown around the world. Um, companies like NVIDIA, a, uh, AMD, um, HTC used it to showcase what cutting edge VR can look like. Um, but as with, VR, it kind of stalled or high level VR stalled a bit, you know, it's sort of, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, Facebook obviously went to standalones and then, uh, you know, the sort of uh, location based entertainment went in a certain direction that was very much IP based. Um, so, you know, come the pandemic, um, I had those experiences, those scene files on that, and they were really beautiful pieces of work. Um, and I thought, well, what if, uh, what if I give those scene files to anybody who who wants to make a, a short film, you know, make a thing out? So I, I'd already given them to uh, Matt Workman. Um, some of you may know Matt Workman as the sort of virtual production guru who's very much been sort of spearheading, um, you know, uh, this sort of work in, in Unreal Engine. Um, so I was, you know, connecting with Matt quite a bit and and uh, and I asked if he wanted to use these scene files to, to recreate something for himself as, as, a, as a demo of what's possible. Um, the success of that was great. What Matt did, I was like, oh, this is awesome. You know, it looks great. And so, the, you know, the idea spawned really quite rapidly and organically, which is like, well, what can anybody do with these, with these assets, which, you know, ties in with machinima is like, well, what, you know, you take what already exists and then sort of reclaim it as your own and build your own story with, with, with what is there. And I think a lot of the sort of stalling of people getting into this and using this is the lack of high level usable assets and here i was had these two great scenes uh you know come with its own animation with all you know all, all that it came with mm -hmm. i said here it is as is you've got 30 days to to make what you want you know make a short film and it was remarkable the results that that we had for that so mm -hmm. so it's it's you know it, it, all these things you know vr game engines uh machinima it all sort of it becomes one, you know, that's not sort of separated out. And so my, my career since Call of Duty has really, really spanned all of those different sort of aspects and touched so many different areas. But at the heart of it is, is game engines, because, um, you know, I think that's what's the, the heart of all, all this creativity. So Absolutely. And how has, um, how has all that influenced how you develop screenwriting these days? What's your view on that? Well, it's interesting. It's kind of come full circle. So I spent many, many years, you know, becoming, you know, pretty good at, at writing a, you know, narrative movie over, you know, 120 minutes in a, in a linear way. Um, I was then employed to work on, you know, interactive mediums in, in gaming. Um, and that sort of expanded my thoughts on how to do that. And then went into VR, which was, you know, a, a sort of spatial storytelling. Um, and then, um, and it's kind of interesting that those, you know, there's, there's amazing things going on within those mediums in VR. Um, but in, in some ways they've sort of, you know, as they've expanded, it's sort of almost, you know, they sort of fell back on gaming in VR, you know, the sort of cinematic storytelling within VR was a harder kind of sell for audiences to latch onto. And so things like music experiences, um, you know, Beat Saber, the sort of gamification of things that were very, very readily accessible and easy to sort of jump into, sort of took off where the sort of more, uh, you know, convoluted storytelling kind of, you know, took more time and resources and, and had a, a lot higher bar, higher level of friction for audiences to sort of engage with that. So I think it's sort of, it's it's stewing. I think it's, it's very much, um, you know, stewing and something very, very good is going to come out of that. But at the same time, I always thought, you know, when I was working on Call of Duty that, you know, I came from screenwriting. And I was like, well, why aren't, you know, I came back to Hollywood and I was like, why aren't people making movies with game engines? Um, it seemed obvious to me, you know, it, and, and I, I always thought the future of 3D and interactive is actually 2D non-interactive because, 
like we are here now we are i mean it's interactive but it's it's 2d screens and, and we yeah. our whole lives are mediated through 2d screens whether that's ipads screens whatever it's, it's mm -hmm. screens um and also movies in this time there's been an explosion of 2d content um you know with the with uh, the netflix explosion and streamers and the desire for more and more and more content so um you know, I think it's sort of two pillars of what audience is like. I think, you know, gaming you know, has massive appeal and massive, you know, audiences and growth. Um, but also movies, uh, you know, people don't stop watching. They're not stopping watching movies. They're watching more movies than ever. You know, they're watching more forms of those content than ever. And so it seemed to it seemed like a sort of logical way of like why. You know, you know, you're, you're sort of going after budgets for VR that, you know, for a half a million dollars, a million dollars to do this thing. And it's been very, very hard to do. And I thought, well, there's this huge market out there where, you know, the likes of Netflix or whoever, you know, dropping tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to make content. And, you know, Apple's coming out with their studio Amazon. Everybody's putting, you know, billions and billions of dollars into 2D content. So it seemed like, well, there's a massive desire for, the content there's the budgets out there that already exist um and now we have this tool where we can just make a a, a movie or a piece of content uh with a game engine um and we can do that more efficiently we can tell stories that couldn't be told before or that it was prohibitively expensive to tell those stories before um and so i thought well this is this is my competitive edge this is what's very interesting to me it's like all those you know, the sort of movie world had got very shoehorned into an idea that, well, all these big studio movies, there's $200 million, another $200 million plus on marketing. It has to make $1.5 billion in order to be a viable thing. You know, to make a movie, you have to, it has to have this whole equation attached to it that obviously has a lot of sign off in terms of the financial side of it and the, you know, who's involved and the time and expense. And we sort of lost this idea of this sort of, Let's go and make something. Let's play. Let's the, the fun of that, the joy of just creating and, you know, finding new forms of expression and also finding new audiences that, that identify with, with, with that stuff. It came, became very monolithic, I think. So, you know, those two things really tied into why I sort of circled back to, to movies. Um, and so in terms of the screenwriting, it's, it's, you know, I turned my attention a few years ago to, well, what, bearing in mind that we're, we're working in a game engine rather than live action you know what are the what are the parts what are the what else the palette we have here what are the tools that uh, enable what type of storytelling so it's not even a sense of, of of how we tell a story because in a sense you know going back to movies it's you know there's a sort of tra even traditional way but you know but the thing is there's there's um stories are enabled by the technology you know, stories are enabled by the tools you deploy to tell those stories and very much shaped by what those tools are. So what if we took game engines and CG assets um, and motion capture, performance capture as, as the starting point of what's possible? Now, obviously, games have used, you know, um, game engines and motion capture for, you know, to very effective storytelling for, for a while. So there's actually a lot to draw upon. But it's amazing how... Um, siloed these these content areas are from gaming to Hollywood to movies to game incredibly incredibly siloed and that was sort of sort of a surprise to me so I thought well there's so much we can learn from gaming um, and there's so much gaming can learn from movies too but so I, I, I sort of predicted this real renaissance that I think is happening with that has been enabled by the technologies and again it's interesting with machinima machinima has been around you know Tracy and, and your, your crew have been involved in machinima for many many years that you know as I said there's all these different roots of these things that have been around that I think are now all being put in put into the soup and I think you've got this really interesting mix of people that have come from these different areas that are now sort of um, you know, making stuff. So it, it's almost like there's this real uh, fermentation going on within the culture. And I think there's going to be a lot of interesting things that really come out of that in the next five, five to 10 years. So in terms of storytelling and screenwriting, it's not even so much like, you know, it, it's more about like, well, what stories can we tell now? So I, I, I had a sort of checklist of, of the types of story we could tell with, with um, CG game engines and performance capture um, that sort of, you know, via 
the, in the traditional live action world, they'd be seen as very expensive kind of, you know, properties. But uh, within this one, if you really need, lean into that and understand that, those stories become the most obvious stories to tell. Mm. Um, so, you know, set in the future, set in the past, set in an alien world, set in somewhere that isn't right now. The hardest thing to do in in, in CG and game engines is to produce the, the here and the now, you know, to re reproduce the sort of, you know, um, the, the photorealism of that, if, if that's what you want. Um, but hey, I want movies set on in foreign worlds and alien planets and strange creatures and, and you know, past historical settings and uh, epic landscapes and characters that are weird, strange and diverse and, you know, that come together. So, so I'm like, well, this, this, is, this is really, really exciting uh, uh, tool set to play with. And, and it's not even just in terms of the form of the story, because, of course, you know, if you're making a movie within a game engine, as I like to say, it's, it's, it's already more than just a movie. You know, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a 3D, potentially interactive um, experience. So, you know, the tools, the, 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 um, you know, the pipeline uh, can equally enable, you know, a piece of VR, a piece, you know, a piece of gaming. So I'm very much interested in the ways in which those sort of traditional narrative stories can then propagate, you know, other forms of interaction with that, that IP, with that intellectual property to kind of expand on that story world um, in other areas. And so storytelling itself, you know, may start in one area, like, oh, it starts in the game, or it starts in the movie, or it starts in that experiential piece. But depending on the story, um, you can then take that story and expand it uh, into, the, you know, using these these uh, these other sort of uh, technology platforms to, you know, create a multifaceted uh, um, um, intellectual property, which of course ties in with how people want to make money. Is Absolutely. you know, you have one thing, you have one thing over here in a story, which is you know, which is going on. I mean, Disney, Disney is is been doing this since uh, since Walt Disney. You know, yeah. you take an IP. You make a, a movie, you market that movie into products, uh, you make a theme park out of that. And, you know, it, it's this, you know, in a way, Disney is, is the sort of business model for all of this. But now, you know, we can do all of that virtually. And so, you know, all of this is all virgin territory for exploration, uh, you know, commercially. And so, um, again, I think it's extremely exciting because, because of exactly that, because creativity needs to be enabled by a sort of economy. Uh, you know, if something that is super creative and interesting can make money, well, guess what? That's just rocket fall on the creativity there. So, so that's 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 super exciting. So, mm, absolutely. Um, now, one of the things that we talked about the last time we spoke was um, that basically you love character design. Um, can you explain a little bit about the work that you've been doing on character design? Um, and um, how you're using that. And of course, you're, you're also uh, an epic mega grant award winner. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit more about that as well. So I said about screenwriting, I mean, my interest was always in, in human beings, I guess, or, you know, human characters. Um, uh, you know, there's nothing more powerful than the human face. So it's, it's no, uh, it's no, um, coincidence that, that, that I got into making very realistic digital humans. Um, so, you know, the, the, the stuff that we got the mega grants for was, was the David Bowie project. So, you know, at the beginning of this, when we sort of set out to like, well, how, what would be the best way to sort of create and communicate the power of a digital human? I thought, well, you know, you could create somebody that is, perhaps no longer with us that, that has, a, has a big global following and that people would be interested to, to see in some way. It seemed like an obvious thing of the historical figures or somebody like Dave, David Bowie. I was a massive David Bowie fan, um, still am, obviously. Um, and of course, music. Music, uh, this, was, we were, this is when we were very much exploring VR. Um, I thought, you know, music was a real way forwards for the creativity of VR you know, narrative, linear, you know, entertainment would, would sort of come, but it's a lot more involved, but there's something very, very immediate in VR, the sense of presence with, the, you know, the experience of music in VR, I think is incredibly powerful. Um, so I thought that was the sort of spearhead that we should be pursuing. So those two things kind of came together 
Um, so I made the, the, the music demo Grace, which was a, a digital pop star in a, in a way, I guess the first kind of digital pop star in some ways, um, particularly in, in Unreal. And so it seemed like, well, let's let's make David Bowie. So we started to make, we self-funded making, making Bowie off the back of another project that we did for Netflix, where we had to create eight digital avatars. So we were sort of, you know, making um, David alongside of that. And and there are many, many different ways about making a digital human. You know, you can, if you're making somebody from real life, you know, you might want to start with with a, with a photogrammetry scan, if, you know, get a, a digital facsimile of that person. But in some, you know, a historical figure or something like Bowie, you're, you're um, using whatever uh, materials are available uh, to create that person. Now, with somebody with as, as much visual reference over 40, 50 years as Bowie, and we had a lot of visual references, but we also had um, two life masks that he made within his lifetime, uh, one, one from 1974 and one from 1983 from the, uh, the movie The Hunger. So I acquired those two life masks. So we had David Bowie age 23 or 24 um, and David Bowie aged uh, 33. Um, so, you know, between them, we made David Bowie age 30 from 1977, first of all. Um, because uh, I, I wanted to make David Bowie with no other sort of makeup and stuff, make him as most sort of to show that we could. So basically, that we want to, I wanted to prove that we could make in VR a digital human, uh, a historical digital human uh, in virtual reality that would really look like like that person. So that was the sort of goal of that is to is to basically prove to the industry because it's very hard to convince people, you know, to for for them to give you money or to greenlight your projects if they don't believe it's possible. <laughs> so yeah. a lot of what we did and that sort of stuff is, is a lot of sort of evangelizing about the technologies, about what is possible. Uh, quite often in the face of people saying, no, you're just not going to be able to do that. And I'm like, well, I think we can. So, so we did it. Um, and Epic obviously, you know, believed us, you know, they, they were very much, um, you know, nobody understands their game engine more than, than Epic. So um, they were very supportive in, in our endeavors. Um, they gave us two mega grants uh, for that project, and um, and through my other contacts, uh, I was able to connect with uh, um, Bill Zisblatt at the Bowie Estate. Um, I'd already reached out to Carlos Alomar, who was Bowie's guitarist, and you know from from many 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 years. And so I was already talking to people, you know, within the Bowie Estate about this, and they were obviously very interested in again what what was possible. Um, and Bowie himself, in his lifetime, was always at the cutting edge of everything, and. Uh, Ironically, it already appeared as a, as a digital avatar in the David Gage um, um, video game uh, Om, Om, Omnicron. I'm getting 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 mixed up now uh, with Omnicron, the the Omnicron variant. But um, um, you know, some twenty years ago. So it, it, ironically, none of these things are new. It's just almost the, you know the level of technology of of where it's at that that is that is new, I guess. Um, so with those things, you know, we, you know, we, we had, uh, you know, sort of permission from the estate to sort of explore this area of what we could do and build, build our Bowie. And then we, we reskinned the 77 Bowie to the Ziggy Stardust Bowie. And we, we made that a, a, a live real time um, uh, asset on, a, on an 8K screen uh, for the 2019 Inf Infinity Festival to sort of just, again, prove, prove what's possible. And then the final mega grant that we got from them, I guess about 18 months ago, about a year ago, uh, we did a, a full music performance test um, of Ziggy Stardust um, using uh, motion capture, performance capture, and animation, um, and and we've 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 got that um, to, again to prove that it was possible to do a full a full uh, performance recreation. So, so yeah, you could say character design has been an interest to me, but um, it's you know the, the the technologies around characters have obviously evolved enormously. Um, primarily through Epic, uh, through MetaHumans. Um, you know, I worked with Three Lateral, who was then bought by Epic and Cubic Motion, and also been bought by Epic, who are basically behind uh, the MetaHumans. So I kind of knew all this stuff was, was in the works and was very excited to see what, uh, what would come of this. Because I, I think one of the most exciting aspects for me as a creator is the sort of, it's a bit of a cliche, but the demo democratization of these technologies. And in a way, that, that, that that um, it's just picking up where machinima has been has been doing that for for a long time is 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 making this stuff 
available to people with a little bit of skill, but an idea to go and make something. Um, for, for, you know, for traditionally the VFX world, um, even gaming, you know, it's, it's been the domain of, you know, experts you know, with expert knowledge, um, highly skilled, um, you know, very intelligent people who are working at a very high level on very expensive things. And, but I, I always think that culture and what's interesting kind of, kind of comes from below, you know, it doesn't come from the top down. It comes from people getting it and making it, you know, it's, 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 it's people picking up a guitar and not knowing how to play it, but learning three chords and then starting a band, you know, it's, it's, um, that's where, where culture happens. And I kind of are very interested in, you know, and I guess that's partly why, you know, I, I created the, the real-time filmmakers Facebook and did the real-time source challenge was to really kind of encourage and cultivate this community of, of people that I saw were, were making, doing interesting things and almost needed a sort of channel and a focus to sort of bring it together. And, and also, you know, I want to find good artists and good people who are doing, doing good things that I can then put on projects and stuff that I'm, that I'm, that I'm making. But um, yeah, it's, it's about the community. It's about the community building. Um, Cause I think that's where the interesting things come from essentially. So. Mm. I mean, the <clears throat> machinima community was always absolutely key to the development of the you know, the whole kind of machinima movement. In yeah. many ways, we've kind of, I suppose really is one of my biggest, not complaints really, but one of my biggest things these days is that where is that community? So, so really when I saw your Facebook group, I was really interested to see how, how that was evolving. I can't believe how many members you've got in such a short period of time. What's, what's kind of behind the success of it from your perspective of it? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I kind of try things because I'm interested in it. And, I, you know, I want to find people that are interested in what I'm interested in. It, 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 uh, it springs from no greater desire than that, really. Um, I hope that people are interested in what I'm interested in um, because I think it's pretty cool. Um, and it, it's about, you know, and, and again, we live in a world where we have the potential to connect to all these other people who kind of think the same way or are interested in the same thing. So, um, you know, there was obviously, I think, a combination of things, really. I mean, I started it just before the pandemic, um, but already there was a lot of moves, um, you know, a lot of talk, I guess. You know, I've been pushing to, to be making content with game engines. I mean, 2D, you know, film content with game engines for a while. And, you know, Matt Workman was doing some, you know, interesting sort of stuff and getting a following and, and Epic were obviously releasing, you know, better and better versions of the engine and demos that were like, well, this is, this is really cool. Um, you know, there was, you know, in movies, you know, the, the, uh, the Lion King and, you know, other, other, mo other movies that were using um, game engines as part of their, their creation process, the growth expansion and development of Previs as, a, you know, Palon, Third Floor, all those folks, you know, doing great work you know, also were deploying game engines. And so it was like the industry at one end was sort of using game engines and sort of coming this way. And then there was people on the grassroots who were using game engines are coming this way. And it seemed like the sort of things were kind of gonna, gonna sort of meet in the middle in some ways. Um, and then, um, you know, the pandemic hit and, it, and I think there was just a lot of like, well, hey, like literally it's kind of, crazy when you think back it seems so crazy now like the whole of film production production just closed down overnight yeah. and there was a lot of sort of you know um, is this the end of things has how we know it is it the end of and you know not all those predictions are true it's amazing how resilient and robust you know ent entertainment is which you know I'm, I'm glad to see but it really helped and people starting to think, well, how can we do things differently? I mean, even now we're on Zoom, right? I mean, mm, that was, Absolutely, you know, yeah. We wouldn't have been doing that. You know, it's, you know, how can people work remotely? Uh, what are the tools available to work remotely? Um, and they were already there, you know what I mean? It, it, just, it just needed, um, you know, a, a greater reason for adoption, I think. Um, so suddenly there was a lot more interest in, in, in these tools and these ways of making stuff. How can we make stuff? And, and again, it, it, you know, I, I started the Facebook group and then I was thinking about doing this short film challenge. And this all happened very, very quickly. 
Um, and it just seemed like a massive interest in this. I mean, you know, people just, just you know, the numbers got up quite quickly. There was a very active community. Um, and then I think me doing the short real-time shorts challenge was a, was a big help because suddenly I had all this energy of people um, and I thought, well, I've got these assets. Why don't I just give it? Why don't we just do this? Let's just see what happens. And uh, this was before all the Unreal Fellowships. This was before all of the uh, other short film initiatives that anybody had ever made. I just thought, well, you know, it just seemed logical to do it. And I had no idea how to do it. Um, and I spoke to my friends at Epic. And they're like, great, we'll give you some money for prizes. And, you know, they were sort of behind it. And, um, you know, other folks, my friends at Faceware and, and Glassbox, you know, they got, everybody was interested to sort of accelerate what, what could be done and see what could be done. So it just happened to sort of coincide at that point, I think. And, and it was a little daunting when I launched it. So I basically had the idea two weeks later, I launched it. I built the website, launched it. And, and a week later, I had something like 170,000 people. Uh, not, yeah, yeah, 100, 170 people, not 170,000. I was going to say, that's oh phenomenal. Uh, um, 170 individuals or teams that had inquired about, inquire, you know, about their participation. With it. And I thought, oh, God, I, you know, had these, these judges like Kim Library and people, you know, like lined up. And I thought, there's no way I could, I could manage 100, 170 short films to sort of or even watch all of them, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but that got whittled down because they had to, uh, uh, you know, sign an agreement as to how they could use these assets. And then there was uh, something like 101 individuals or teams that downloaded the actual the scene files and assets. And even that was like, okay, I got to, you know, what if I have 100 short films in 30 days? How am I going to get through, get through that? But um, you know, obviously, it's you know, when you see the assets, you see what you can do. This is during the pandemic. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody was in. Some people wanted to do it, but weren't able to for whatever reason. Um, you know, it was a tall order. Here's some assets. Here's 30 days. Pull whatever resources you have. Come back 30 days' time with, with something you've made. Um, but out of that, we had 30 short films completed. And I thought, well, that's good. I mean, I, I initially, when I launched, I thought maybe I'd be lucky if I had 10, you know. And um, we had 30, which is a, a manageable amount. And it was it was amazing. It was It was amazing to see... Two scenes. I had obviously worked, you know, a few years before on these these very, you know, great VR scenes. Um, so I was very, very familiar with them. And then to see what people had done with them to either, you know, create their own story within that, repurpose, reuse, um, you know, to create something completely different or something within that genre or... Uh, it was wonderful. I mean, I don't, I don't know if anybody's done that before. I mean, again, it's enabled by the technology. It's like, okay, well, these are the assets for the movie. Now everybody else go and do it. And then again, like Machinima is, is the sort of precedent for that. It's like, well, here are the assets of, of, the, of the game. Okay. Now you can just go and use them. And, and that sort of came out organically from, from those becoming available and people sort of modding and stuff. Um, but it was very much seemingly in the, in, the, in the sort of fringes of things. It wasn't like that wasn't built into the business model. And yet now that's kind of the way I now think about the future of content is like, well, how can we enable a community to be creating with this? You know, where does the, the, uh, the filmmakers and creators who are sort of top down authors of their work, where do they meet with the user generated creators who are also part of the audience to sort of, you know, expand and enhance on, on, on the story, the IP in whatever way that it happens, you know? Mm. So, you know, all of these things happen very, um, organically and as a response to what was happening. And, and again, I think that that's one of the exciting things is, is these technologies allow is the sort of um, responsiveness to it. You know, you can iterate, you can make a short film within 30 days, given these assets, you know, um, and, and not only just short films, but really good short films, you know, like they looked amazing. I mean, the, you know, the problem then was, you know, we had 30 short films, but how do we decide how to judge these. I mean, judging wasn't necessarily the, the, the goal, although, you know, that sort of brings people together because I think they were all fantastic. Um, you know, there was sort of 10 that sort of won prizes, but uh, all of them are worth watching for, yeah. for, their, own, for, for their own reasons. And, um, and uh, so it was, it, was, it was just an interesting experiment. And as I said, the, the, the quality of the work from those assets was was amazing um and i thought well you, you know what if we then put that up to like a feature film level you know what if it, what if we design our sort of workflows and our thought processes and our business model around a similar kind of concept 
Um, and so that's what I've been after that. I, I after that, you know, that I very much put my thoughts into, you know, I'm a Nicole fellow screenwriter. So I know a lot of screenwriters and there are a lot of scripts out there that, um, that haven't been made with live action that maybe we could, you know, re refit for, for making with the game engine. Um, and so I, and then, so I'm trying to get one movie off the ground and then and I wrote another movie just over, over the winter, uh, which was the first movie that I've written as a, as a purpose built for the game engine equation to make on a low budget, um, which I'm pretty excited about. And then just out of the blue in, in very recently in the last month, which I think since we spoke, maybe, I don't know. So I've been, I've been um, working with a, a very well-known filmmaker who's done big studio movies and indie movies. Uh, who is a super, super cool filmmaker. Um, and he wants uh, to make his next movie in Unreal. Oh, and, wow. you know, and so I'm, I'm working with him to see how we can do that. And they've got a decent budget. And it's, it's kind of like the perfect storm for, for me. Um, everything that I've been working towards, you know, get somebody who's a really good filmmaker, who's actually got a really, really good script. Um, it does have a, a pre-established IP that has an audience, which is also re really cool. Um, and I, we have the 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 means and the ability to make this movie, um, you know, in a way that you just couldn't have, you know, before. Um, and so with a, it, a whole bunch of people that have now developed the skill set in order to work on it too, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. No, the the the. the you know, I've got a small team uh, led by my my technical director Richard Harada, who's he's been with me for a long time. He's basically the the spine of the whole operation. Um, but in order to make a feature film, we obviously have to expand upon that, and it's been great. because I've been reaching out to a bunch of a bunch of folks within the community that I obviously become friends with, um, who are just you know all the all the folks that you see that are doing amazing work. Mm -hmm. They're all really really excited to be working on this, and so suddenly I've got you know the best the A team to sort of do this. So in a way that the last couple of years has really sort of found those people and they're all over the world as well. Mm. You know? uh, and they're all super excited because they all share the same, the same uh, vision that we have over this. And so I'm, I'm hoping, uh, you know, touch wood, um, you know, it, you know, we, we, uh, we could very well, and I think it's just going to take one, like if one feature film uh, made completely in, in a game engine that has been made, in this way, um, it, it will it will break the mold, and uh, I think it will really really open things up to to you know investors, studios being a lot more receptive to then putting money into smaller creators with ideas that can mm. sort of you know execute. Um, I'm hoping. I'm hoping. You know, we'll see. As I said, I, I think the, the 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 need and desire for more content and good content as well uh, can only help that process because we want new voices new stories and a really cool visual medium and it's like well tick 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 you know mm -hmm. so so but it just it just takes you know i think one good movie um to to prove that it can be done and to sort of reveal how how we made it and uh, i think that will help really help advance things and, and get it to a, a, a level of conversation within the, the 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 wider culture rather than just in the sort of you know machinima you know, unreal dev community, uh, you know, where it exists right now. Mm, yeah. I mean, from my point of view, I mean, I, I, this is one of my pet things as well, really. I think one of the biggest challenges that we've faced during this sort of pandemic time is, is the fact that people aren't, you know, they, I guess they haven't really had time to develop great stories, although we have, on certainly on this show, I think, picked up more and more stories that are coming through towards the back end of the pandemic. But yeah. the bulk of folks are actually making tutorials about yeah. tech. And I, I kind of really want to sort of say, get on, make some content, make some, make some movie, <laughs> make some film, make some something creative, not just the tutorials. Yeah. And my, yeah. my guess is that's the period that we're going into now from, from what you're saying as well. I certainly hope so. I think, you know, there's a lot of, you know, good work being done to, you know, propagate the, the, the use of engines for, you know, tutorial, you know, that, that's obviously a part of it. Um, I mean, it's also the sort of gold rush thing that, you know, there are people out there mining, mining for gold and putting physical, but the people making the money are the, are the people selling them picks and shovels, you know, yeah, and, that's kind of, and that's kind of, kind of where it's at now. 
Um, so I, I don't know. It, it, it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, the Unreal Fellowships, you know, required, you know, people to, to make something, I think, which is re really, really good and healthy. Um, I also wonder to the degree in which we've, you know, as a sort of, you know, my generation when I came up, you know, I went to film school. I was all about telling a story, making, making a movie. I think there's perhaps less of that in the culture, strangely, um, in terms of the desire to tell a story. Um, partly because I think the channels for telling story has been limited. You know, it's you know, the the range of content um, that is is available has become slightly monolithic, and sort of there are people who make content that costs a lot of money in its studios, and there isn't a sort of more grassroots kind of um, culture of, of of making stuff. And I think that's partly been because it's it's been you know filmmaking has got more and more expensive. You know, and and the channels for low budget stuff have, have narrowed as the sort of indie sector has been squeezed out, you know, for all sorts of, you know, reasons. Um, so I, I don't know. And also, yeah, as with machinery, it's kind of interesting because it's a sort of blessing and a curse. Because I think the reason why people got into machinery in the first place was because you, they loved that game and they loved that look and they loved that feel and they wanted to play with the, the very things that it was. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like this sort of idea that, you know, we see a lot of unreal demos of people making, oh, here's a scene from Star Wars, or here's my Mandalorian, here's my Boba Fett. And I think that that's, you know, on the one hand, completely legitimate. And, and that's their passion to kind of, they want to recreate what was previously only possible with millions of dollars of budgets and the huge thing. Like, I mean, there's, there's a huge thrill in, oh my God, there's my, and you know, in a way I've done it with David Bowie. You know what I mean? Like I've taken what existed before and I re recreated it. You know, there's a huge thrill and excitement about being able to do that within, within your own hands and your own grasp. So I get that. That's the sort of passion for it. But then you see a lot of sort of like Star Wars recreations, you know, fan work, which, you know, can look good because they, they want to, they want to hit the bar of it, it looking like it could be in Star Wars, which is, which is, generally the goal but it sort of misses the point of like well star wars is amazing because george lucas is an amazing storyteller who created this world and these characters that we wanted to follow and explore and you know it was it was, it was just beautiful and that's what spawned a, you know a, an ip that's lasted nearly half a you know, century and continuing you know and is you know i i came up in the generation i was you know i was born in 1969 so i grew up in the 70s and 80s and you had folks like Ridley Scott, you know, making Alien, Ridley Scott making Blade Runner, um, even, you know, Spielberg and Lucas. You know, these were all at the time completely original movies because they were storytellers. I'm like, we're going to make this original movie and it's going to be amazing. And it was from that that spawned, you know, the sequels, the remakes, the reboots, the, the, the whatever. And um, so the culture has shifted. I think from, from younger generations, perhaps, they're much more... Um, surrounded by reboots and redos um, um, than original content. So the sort of mindset is more about how do I engage with that world, like with the, the Marvel universe, how do I engage with that world rather than have the desire, I'm going to go and make my Star Wars or I'm going to go and make my, my thing. Um, because when I grew up, it was all original. It was all original and new content. And that was what was exciting about it. You hadn't seen, when Alien came out, you hadn't seen that. You just literally hadn't hadn't seen anything like it before. When, when you know, Ridley did Blade Runner, you hadn't seen that before. And it's funny because, you know, I post stuff, there's a, a, a demo that was out, a scene the, the other day that, you know, people were commenting, well, and it looks just like Blade Runner, you know, and it's like, great. We've now, we can now, you know, 40 years later, we can now build a Blade Runner for ourselves. And, and there's a thriller in that. Uh, but again, where are the new Blade Runners? You know, yeah. where, are the new, where are the new Ridleys? You know, um, and I think they're there. I think there's a massive amount of talent and creativity. And I think, you know, we're in that, that, that sort of process of, of the technologies becoming available to people and then people actually taking it and actually making stuff for themselves. Um, and again, I think it kind of does come down to a few uh, leading examples to show that it's possible. Again, that's why I've always pushed for like, let's make a feature film. Let's make a feature film that exists on, on, on the landing page of a streamer alongside any other movie. And you don't even think, oh, this is made in Unreal or whatever, or it's made for a tenth of the budget that you think it cost, you know. Um, it just is, is there. And I think, you know, a few of those, and then we're going to get a lot more people coming out and doing really, really cool things. Um, 
so it's just a matter of time, I think. But I, I think it's I think it's happening. Uh, but I share, I, you know, I share your. It's sort of like, oh, we can do all this now, but where's it all going? I, I think the world is changing in very interesting, interesting ways, and I'm certainly pushing for for what happens next within within filmmaking and the, this sort of creative environment. And what advice would you have for um, machinima creators these days if they want to make the career out of being an indie creator? Have you got any thoughts about, <clears throat> you know, how the how the workflow is evolving and how they might actually make it a living? Um, I think it's interesting. I think it's hard because we've, um, the world has become way more corporatized um than it was that that you couldn't sort of it's harder to be an indie freelancer to some to some degree so people's ambitions have been um you know channeled in that direction so they want to work you know i do a lot of um you know talking to colleges and stuff and students i'm very you know interested in encouraging and you know people to to explore this world and a lot of people's like well how can i get a job in this and i'm like well what if the, ch- the industry is changing so that you actually don't want to go to a bricks and mortar job, you know, and have that same structure. So it's interesting. The pandemic again accelerated this. Everybody's got used to this idea where you just get a job. You work for this company and you work on this big production, this big video game or this big movie in the visual effects. Department, and you'll be just this one part of that. And you'll just like learn what that thing is. Um, and that's your career. And, and in some ways, I think that's that level of specialization is, is going to be a hindrance. Um, because that level of production may not be what it is, and you're not going to need that level of specialization. I mean, certainly on my productions, what we're looking at is is hiring sort of like a handful of uh, heads of departments and then having a lot of um, 3D generalists who don't necessarily have to be very specialized or especially skilled, have the desire to learn and to create and be able to say, okay, now we're going to do this so that we can actually take them off on one thing, put them on something else. And in terms of our workflow and efficiencies, it's actually really important for all of the sort of team members to really understand where they exist on the, on the, on the workflow. Mm-hmm. Uh, either it's, uh, you know, rather before, like, you know, you, in, in the visual workflow, it becomes so specialized. It's like, there's this person that does this really, really well. And then there's this person that does this thing really, really well. And, the thing is, with I think working with a game engine is you kind of have to understand the whole workflow, or at least have an idea as to how the person next to you, or you know, if you're handing off assets to somebody, as to what what are they going to do with those assets? What do they need from you in order to be 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 the link in the chain? And so, you know, being a generalist at this point, I think is 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 really key. Um, again, it's hard to tell because there's so much expansion. Everybody's wanting kind of UE people, but they, what they want is really good UE people. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of people learning Unreal, um, but still the, the people who are really good at Unreal are like hen's teeth. Um, you know that's obviously going to change because people. But the, the healthy thing is there's a lot of uh, productions going on that are now using Unreal. You know I've talked to a lot of the big animation companies and they're switching a lot of their workflows over to real time, real time, real time, real time. Mm-hmm. So. Um, so I think that there's a, you know, and again, like I said, there's more stuff being made. So in terms of a career, um, I don't know, dive in, get a job with one of these companies, perhaps, you know, learn on that. But I've, I've always been super encouraging of being your own business, your own creator. Um, and I think um, that will open up that, you know, the sort of creator economy around making stuff. If you can kind of be an indie creator that, then make something that's pretty cool that has a following that then you know gets sold to a studio um i i don't know i that's always been what i wanted to do you know i don't necessarily want to work for somebody else on somebody else's thing i'd much rather sort of you know it's it's more about a a means of artistic creative expression you know to tell a story that hasn't been told before or or to to do something and Um, what's What's your view of the platforms that we've got uh, uh, at the moment? Like, you know, the, I don't know, the Prime, the Netflix, the ch- you know, the channels through which this content is streamed. How do you see that evolving? Well, it's very interesting. So, so you know, Netflix is obviously, you know, upturned the Apple cart 10 years ago or so um, mm. and really changed things around. And then, of course, now Netflix in the last month or two have seen a... a um, 
a reduction in their profits. And then there's, you know, as as uh, their sort of, you know, copycat competitors, you know, in 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 Prime and Apple and and um, Paramount and HBO, you know, all these other companies, Disney, you know, are, well, that works. You know, we, we've got all this stuff. And so um, it's going to be very interesting. I mean, again, I think it can only benefit in that they all are competing for content. They all need good content. So at the moment, the sort of content that they're going after to is the sort of uh, traditional business model of like, well, who are the stars? You know, so Ryan Murphy can get half a billion dollars because he's the star of making, you know, uh, TV. Uh, so, so Netflix can can sign him or what, or Shonda Rhimes or somebody for, you know, they've proven themselves to be, you know, money earners and uh, audience generators. Um, so that, you know, the, the studios then are vying to write as big a check as possible for those folks. But, you know, who's coming behind them? You know, they're, they're, there's, um, you know, A, they're expensive and not necessarily provable, you know, mm-hmm. things change, audiences change. Um, so I don't know, again, I, I, I think um, if, if you're able to make content that is good, uh, and again, I, I kind of like, well, we need to be making feature films or more long form content because there's a market for that. There isn't really a market for short films. Um, you know, Love, Death and Robots is this wonderful compendium of short films, but, but it's kind of unique. That's that's almost it, I guess, you know, in terms of like where it exists. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm my whole thing is like, well, let's let's make some low budget feature films in this method. And let's let if you, you know, you make some good ones and then that's going to really accelerate that. And then because there seems to be, you know, as I said, uh, the studios are always going to be wanting to make content. You just we just have to prove that this is a viable and money making exercise mm. and that we can make good movies. Um, so there's audience for short form content, but not market is what you're saying. Um, I don't know. Again, I think Love, Death and Robots has been very successful. I don't know where it sits within in Netflix's equation, you know, how they how they view that sort of compendium. Um, yeah, I don't I would love to see more of that. It, it, it's um, I think it's great. It, it's interesting, though, because, you know, the, the Love, Death and Robot budgets are kind of you know, expensive, you know, that, that's not cheap animation, you know, um, it's not really what we're talking about with, you know, machinima and, you know, mm. yeah, I think, I think there's a way to make it a lot more efficiency, you know, it's still, you know, David Fincher and Tim Miller, you know, brilliant as they are, but this is still A-list Hollywood sort of, you know, top down sort of like, it's all the sort of A-list animation companies like Axis and, you know, people like that and, and, and Blur, you know, and Sony, you know, make, making this stuff. I think there's a huge, um, um, opportunity for people who make stuff, and that's why I'm, I'm just like, go and make something, dude. You know what I mean? Like, make, make whatever it is, make it. Um, and if you make something good, I, th- I think that will, that will be noticed. And I think that the the climate for you know interest for something new, different, and cost effective is is really really ripe. So, I, but it, you know, I'm with, it takes way longer than you think. Like, even the fact that I'm talking to this filmmaker now and like I'm super excited because I'm like, okay, now like legitimate established talent really is getting the equation. But again, that's the kind of, maybe it's a, it's interesting because, because they were trying to get this movie off the ground for like, and they couldn't get the budget below $50 million. And I'm like, oh, we, we can, we can totally do this. So they're like super excited. They're like a very established filmmaker now super excited because they've kind of been, you know, like, well, how do we, how do we make movies anymore? You know, how does anybody make an interesting movie because nobody wants to take the risk or nobody has the cost, the, the, the budget to do it. And the amount of, you know, financial kind of sign offs you need to make a movie now is just, you know, ridiculous. So the sort of the creators out there, established creators, once we can prove to them that this is a really viable you know pipeline and a means of making stuff i think that you're just going to have a lot of people because people in this industry are super creative they're in it for the creativity you know they want to there's a lot of very creative people out there who can't you know established filmmakers who can't get their movies off the ground because it takes years and years and years to put these different financing together and then they've got all these constraints of who they put in the movie you know what the movie is all this sort of stuff and it all stems from the fact that they've got you know so expensive it's all risk mitigation so, you know, once you take that risk out, if it doesn't cost 50 million, it costs 5 million, then you can suddenly 
cast who you want. You can make all the decisions yourself. You can have final cut. It's it. You can own it. You know, the filmers can own that. And that's just the beginning of what you then do with that, that IP in terms of, you know, as I said, like a movie made in a game engine is, is already more than a movie. So um, the, the ones that are getting that are like, you know, getting on board. So I, I think it's just a matter of time. I think we're going to have a very interesting next next five years, hopefully. And I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that we get to do this, you know, feature film. I think it will really change the game. And so I'm, I'm really excited about doing that. But, you know, we'll see. Wow. Well, that sounds like a really good place to stop. And then next time we speak, you can tell us exactly what the project is <laughs> and then we can look forward to uh, look, well, viewing it when it comes through the distribution channels. Mm -hmm. um, so appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today, John. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Tracy. It's been a pleasure.